Hello, project people. Welcome to the Project Chatter podcast. I'm Val Matthews, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Dale Fung. Hello, folks. Hey, Val. Hey, buddy. Uh, just a reminder to listeners to hit subscribe, that subscribe button on whichever platform you listen to your good podcasts on and your YouTube channel for bonus bits. On this episode, we're, we're joined by Steve Wake. Hey, Steve. Great to have you on the pod. Well, good to be here. Indeed. On this pod, we'll be chatting to Steve Wake about a very interesting subject that is earned value management and earned value analysis. Uh, but before we get into that, here's Dale with Steve's bio. Cheers, Val. This is one heck of a bio, so I hope everyone listens into this. So Steve is at the forefront of the development of national and international standards in project controls and management. A genuine thought leader, a super connector, a maven. He is a member of the Management Standards Committee of the BSI, currently progressing project controls and benefits management. He is an internationally acknowledged expert on earned value project management, most recently on the newly published ISO standards for EVM and WBS, and currently he is working on ISO EVM implementation guide. Steve works with governments, national and international bodies and academia as a subject matter expert as well as on matters of governance. Steve was one of the authors of Agile Portfolios with ABC. With his Guild of Educators hat on, he is working with OECD and the City of London to introduce fusion skills internationally to children aged 70 to 70 plus. I love that line, children aged 70 to 70 plus. <laughs> he is also currently working on a think tank, sorry, a think tank for major sporting events. In the afternoons, he is championing circular economies and sustainability to combat climate change. He has worked in the automotive, automotive, print aerospace, defense, insurance, and IT industries as a project manager and consultant. He led the Association for Project Management to the award of Royal Charter. He is chief examiner for EVM and planning with APMG. He curates and chairs his own highly regarded EVA conferences, now in its 25th year, and also curates the PMI's major synergy event now in its 10th year. He is a visiting lecturer at Warwick WMG, Cranfield and UCL, as well as the Moscow School of Economics. He has an MA in Manpower, specializing in sociology and psychology of organizations, and is a member of the London Mozart Players Development Group. His long passion for all kinds of music is almost matched by his continued appreciation of silence. Wow. That is amazing. I I don't know if I've come across. Um, how, how how can I put this? More um, uh, amazing bios revolving around so much that we know and love in the project management space, particularly with EVM, um, than this one. Um, but I, I I also love your your final sentence in your bio, um, which contradicts each other in a way where you can't have silent music, Steve. Um, but welcome to the pod. How are you feeling? Good and silent. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, hopefully... I'll, I'll spare you the agony of being silent for the next hour. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I'm sure we'll all, yeah, we will all be wiser after, yeah. after this conversation. So really um, privileged to have you on the pod, mm -hmm. um, as, as Val was saying. But I want to, I guess, let, let's start with... Um, we always we always like to use the phrase baseline. Let, let's start with setting a baseline for everyone. Um, and I, I guess EVM, um, as most know, it's a, it's a methodology. But if you had to do your elevator pitch to someone that doesn't know what EVM or EVA is, what would you say to them? Um, things that people relate to. Uh, um, so I'm not necessarily going to give you the 80, the 80 second pitch because you vary it in the context of who you're talking to. Absolutely. But if you really want to get EVM embedded as an idea into um, uh, an organization, what you do is you uh, I actually did this as a, an exercise in, in Germany a few years ago, which was I did a week's tuition on, on, on a value technique. 
in Frankfurt, and um, one of the exhibitions, were, one of the exercises was give a pitch towards the end of the, the, the four or five day course that I was running. And uh, a pitch, elevator pitch was 90 seconds. And what these guys for the most part did, and it was a bit cruel, was they tried to encapsulate SPI, CPI, eco economy, efficiency, that sort of stuff. Uh, um, the technique boiled down into 90 seconds. And I said, the real uh, uh, objective of the elevator pitch is to get the meeting where you have the discussion. So what you do is you, you follow the MD or the chief financial officer until they get into the lift, try and make sure they're on their own and then pin them to the wall as you, you go up, <laughs> ideally pressing the, the alarm button so everything stops. And you say, uh, uh, and the key objective is get the meeting so that you can talk to somebody. For God's sake, have the presentation in your back pocket in, in case they call you bluff and say, come on then, let's go. Or there's a board meeting taking place. But effectively, you, you talk in big numbers. So here's a method that is used on the largest projects on the planet. Uh, the American government uses it. It was used to build the Olympics. It's used to develop the CERN project. It's being run to do the ETAIR fusion project down in the south of France. The Highways Agency uses it. Many, you know, the, our English MOD uses it now. The biggest and large, Walt Disney uses it. Uh, NASA uses it. You know, so if you want to be, so by association, uh, you should be using this method. It's, it, it's deemed to be the best way of, of, of measuring and monitoring a, a project. Um, and, and that way you avoid all the heartache and the hassle that it takes to actually make it work. But above all, you, you need to get into the skin of somebody who, whose appetite is, is, is basically, so you, you want them to salivate the fact that this can bring them and their organization greater glory by more effectively delivering projects and programs. So if you were trying to do that in construction, um, one of the phrases would be, well, what if, what if, what if you could put a 1% extra on, on the bottom line in terms of profitability using this stuff? because our construction industry in the UK functions on two to 3%. So imagine if you could save 1% in your project costs and then pass and, and, and convert that into, into profitability. One of the things that I got the, uh, the government for, um, there was a, and this, was, this is what really got me into to earn value, was seeing a note, a headline article in the Guardian uh, talking about something like 12 billion pounds, uh, no, yeah, about 12 billion pounds, no, 1.2 billion pounds worth of waste identified in, in, uh, in projects. This was in 1994. <clears throat> and I sat there as a consultant working for a software company at the time, a company called Artemis, who did some of the largest project management software in the world at that point. Um, and he got paid a decent amount of money in those days too. And um, we were flogging a dead horse trying to take the notion of earned value into companies who were just folding their arms and saying, well, they do project management already. What the hell do they need this for? But I thought, well, what if using earned value, you could get the government's program to, 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 to save that 1.2 billion pounds worth of waste and track it? And even if you halved it, you know, half a billion pounds pays for a hospital or two. Mm. Uh, and it was that kind of ideological drive that, that, that really set me off on the road of convincing people at the higher level. So what I did after that was I, I got to see, if you want to pitch, I, I got into, well, firstly, I got into the National Audit Office, who were linked to our Public Accounts Committee, and fed them earned value. And it appeared uh, as, as two pages in the Eurofighter program report as recommended update of practice. And the other side of my twin pronged attack was that I got hold of Michael Portillo, who happened to be Minister for Defence at the time. <clears throat> and I got to see him twice and pitched earned value at him. He lifted the phone, apparently, as the minister called up the MOD and said, see this guy. Because apparently there's a little book which says, you know, see this guy. And my name got that my name went in the book. And so for the first few years, I could I could have every conversation I've I, I had a civil servant from the MOD, begging me never go to the minister again, because all hell breaks loose. It's like a depth charge going in when, when it comes from on high. <laughs> it explodes at every level until it finds what it needs to be spoken at. So uh, before before that, every meeting I had was, well, thanks very much. We, we, we use risk management to, to, to do this kind of stuff. 
So, and this was in the 1990s. So I, I've wandered off the question a bit, but you know, you really have to identify your target. And I can pitch earn value at every project controls or PMO in the country, but they're not gonna really do it unless somebody very senior um, buys the idea mm -hmm. and then really, really critically sponsors it in that true meaning of the word sponsoring it so that they're prepared to support uh, and potentially change the culture to adapt to, to be able to effectively utilize this, this, this kind of method. So, and that was a big, that was a big lesson that I learned once we started to get in with earned value over here. Um, one was um, nobody was marketing it. So I had to market it myself. That's where the conference came from. I realized that nobody was going to sell it for me. So the conference was set up to, to sell it. And the difference after 25 years is that in, in conference year one, on one day, we had 12 speakers, 11, 11 of them were American. Wow. Uh, speaking American, uh, an English audience, you know, do this, do that. The, the really mm. sort of pugnacious hectoring kind of style. I had the orders of general. Sir John Bourne at the time. I managed to get him because of the help I'd given. Uh, and somebody from Rolls-Royce as well, uh, but, uh, but who was working on um, uh, an American project. After 25 years, it's now two days, and we have maybe one presentation on earned value specifically. Uh, and the vast majority of the speakers, whilst I can get an international set of speakers, are mostly from the UK. So things have, things have really changed. So there's the, the marketing to create the community, and um, really just that sort of just pl plugging away, at, at pushing it and pushing it and pushing it to, to get it to work. And once you have that, then, then, then you can really start to, to change the, the way that organizations move. But the, the big failure is to take earn value into an organization. And some of the big boys are hugely embedded in their own culture and behavior. Um, that it's not plug and play. You, you can't just bung it in and, and expect it to work. You actually need to figure out what the culture is, see how truly mature they are with general project management practices, because most of them don't know their own project management capability um, very well. So really, we, we, we preface any, any implementation of their values in, in with effectively a maturity audit. And we try and look for the gaps that need maturity level three, uh, basic project management, program management competence. And then once we're, we're convinced that we've got you to that stage, then we'll start to, to, to lay in earned value to further develop those techniques and practices. Um, and that, that, that took us about three years to figure out that, that, that that's what was happening. Um, I, um, I think one of you works for TFL, don't you? Yeah, yep. it's you, isn't it? No? Um, yep. You see, I, I remember again taking a course into into the an underground one of the underground companies. Um, it was over at Canary Wharf, so the change had happened, and um, I um, uh, ran, ran a couple of days. At the end of two days, they'd all understood it, but they were still waiting for the silver bullet, the magic bullet. You know? So that, that 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 adage that actually there's there's a lot of, a lot of hard work, and it chimes with the you know the harder I work, the luckier I get. So the more effective my project management practice is, the better the earned value will be. Uh, but it still takes work. It doesn't magically substitute and take away all the onerous effort that you need to do to, 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 to do it well. Um, and, and again, quite frankly, a mindset that thinks that this kind of job is easy is, 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 is on for great disappointment and a sort of cycle of failure um, by, by never getting it quite right. My advice as a consultant to organizations like that is that don't do project management anymore. Just stop. Just, just fumble away, you know, give yeah. them all a copy of something. Um, and I won't get sued by, you know, but just a, a, st a standard piece of software, project management, and just let everybody work individually and separately, thinking that they're, they're doing things by banging out a Gantt, a Gantt chart and, um, and um, updating it occasionally. You know, Saving <laughs> stuff a fortune. So um, <clears throat> I'm rambling now, but, you know, that, that's uh, to go back, it has to, you, I, I absolutely subscribe to the idea that you really, really need a community. Uh, and you really need um, the highest level possible support and sponsorship to, to, to get this to, to work. And um, I, I can only say that after several years of doing it, about six years in, 
from from sort of uh, taking it on. Well, four years on, I went to the APM, the Association for Project Management, said, do you want to do a SIG? And they said, yes. A couple of years later, we banged out a, uh, a guide uh, for, for, for earned value. And then three or four years after that, we thought we'd won because we went to the MOD and the MOD said, we now, and I was, I was there when the announcement was made, um, uh, that they, they decided to mandate the use of earned value within the MOD. So picture um, the shores of Troy and a wooden horse. And um, so we, we, we all buggered off thinking we've done it, we've won, you know, they're going to use earned value. No, they weren't. They, they found every possible way not to. And um, uh, essentially, there were so many loopholes and, and, and bits and pieces and loop, loose, loose ends that in actual fact, that, that sort of overarching take up of, of earned value didn't really take place. And, and uh, again, lots of other project management initiatives ebb and flow, you know, they have their, their sort of cycle of e evolution. And I think we're, we're now, you know, it's like Venus aligning with Mars and all that sort of stuff. Well, there, there's a current fresh alignment and, and uh, earned value is again being taken seriously. But it normally takes a crisis to do it. You know, um, uh, we, we had a, we had a, uh, Artemis had a, uh, a piece of software called uh, Integrated Cost Schedule Control System, which was called ISIS, unfortunately. Um, not, not, I don't think they could market it too well now, but... Um, the uh, um, it, it chimed with CS, uh, CS, which was cost schedule control system, which the Americans called C spec, which they also called earned value. And we used to say as consultants, ha ha ha, ISIS, um, you know, ISIS in a crisis, buy me and stop one. Crisis, that is. And because uh, you'd have a, an ice cream seller uh, and they'd say, buy me and stop one. So we, um, we used to flog a dead horse and watch the ice cream melt, you know, with, through the saltiness of our tears as we tried to, to sell it. But we, um, we, uh, you know, we, 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 we started to unpick the software. And, uh, uh, and I also realized that just by offering technical solutions, it wasn't going to work. And all I had to support me at the time was a bloody great big American textbook. Um, it was about 400 pages thick and classic American textbook, which was about 390 pages too long. <laughs> it was the real meat, but there was some real meat in it if you had the, the, the patience to um, go through it and pick it out. So what I also did was, and I'm, you might have one, Dale, um, I produced my famous EVA in the UK booklet, which was 90 pages of me writing in a very sort of journalistic, punchy style selling the book uh, uh, and extolling its virtues in ways that I thought that, you know, the general reader, e even a senior manager could, could get through in half an hour and, and, and know something a bit more about the subject without feeling completely alienated by loads of algorithms and, and, and metrics and curves. And I, I sold, they sold by the truckload. I, I made a fortune um, selling these booklets for a fiver, you know, which, which cost me a couple of quid to produce so I could give them away as well as sell them. But I ended up selling uh, in, in the first eight years of its existence, 60,000 copies. You know, so there are loads and loads of them in circulation. They, they're even on eBay. Wow. Uh, so, um, uh, but I also found again, that it was that simpler language of communication, which, which, which built it. So, what I'm trying to say, I think, is that you can't go, to, you shouldn't go to a catalog and buy own value. There's so much more that you needed, or I found that I needed to do in order to give it the traction and the leverage that it really needed to take root within the UK. But I think I was probably thinking more ambitiously than quite a few people would. And I certainly wasn't going to rely on the incumbent associations, ministries uh, uh, of, of the day to do it for me. Because um, in my experience, um, mo most, most associations, whilst it says on the door for and on behalf of the members, they don't mean it. Um, they, they just want to monetize their, their, their products and flog exams and certifications and accreditations and get members. They're not necessarily uh, pointed directly at the, the greater good of the, mm. uh, of, the, of the subject area, the community, or indeed the common good. Um, or the public good, as it says on 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 on, um, on some of their uh, um, public pronouncements and, and, and articles of association. So um, I, I, I found that the best way was to create a small army um, of people that were interested in doing it. I continue to do so. 
Um, the small army at that time were, were basically representatives of some of the larger companies and associate uh, uh, organizations uh, in the UK at the time. And we, and we were ramping up for the Olympics as well. So there was a lot of traction from that. Um, and uh, kind of kept that, 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 that body of people going through, through, through the, through the um, conferences themselves. And uh, also through, uh, uh, and now looping through again, through the second turn of the wheel, because again, the ambition is possibly a little bit larger. That notion of having a community to, to do what I call pulling into use a standard, because you know, I think standards are, um, uh, are highly essential. But you've got you can't just float, you just can't write it and fling it over the fence and expect people to rush out and buy it and use it. You know you've got to have a bunch of organisations, people at a senior level, prepared to sponsor, participate in the elaboration of that work, and then be ready to use it. You know to pull it into use when it, once it gets published. So um, I'm still kind of doing trying to do the same thing that I did when I set out creating the community, well, 25, 30 years ago. Do you want to ask me a question? <laughs> no, I've been loving yeah, listening that, to that this. Was, that was really. No, on, honestly, it, 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 you've touched on so many things. I was making mm. notes in the background while you're talking um, on, on one of your last points on that army. I mean, we, we'd love to join that army if you know there's any opportunity there to to help promote it. Because um, both Val yeah, and I, well, are, I can, are, I can I'll, I'll tell you. Well, I'll tell you how that. Well, firstly, there was there was the SIG, a specific interest group uh, in the APM, which um, <clears throat> again a piece of history that not many people will know is that there was actually an EVM SIG before I marched in in 1998, but it, it, it died on its ass. You know, it just didn't get going and um, because nobody was really interested. Um, so there were people there that were interested, I think, in the, in the esoterics of, 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 of the mathematics. Um, and uh, so it died. So when I came, went back in, it was as though I, it had just arrived again. So um, uh, as I said, I, I, I tried as far as possible to make that SIG uh, a doers group as again as far as possible populated with what I would characterize as sharp end practitioners heads of programs heads of project controls people really doing the job as opposed to and again I you know I'm, I, I, um, I, I know that consultants have to make a living but sometimes the last people on God's earth you want developing a standard as a consultant you know you want somebody who's doing the job Rather yep. than somebody who thinks they know how the job's to be done. Val would like um, you, you saying that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. But you see, I try very hard not to advertise or publicize or promote. You, If you ever get an email from me, you get it from Steve Wake. You don't get it from Steve Wake, MA, CBS, APM, you know, yep. butcher to the gentry or, 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 or all the sort of window dressing that, that, that goes on the bottom of many, many emails. I think I mentioned just before we started the, um, the program, uh, my conference has been running for 25 years. I have willfully and deliberately never presented except on one occasion. And that one occasion, um, you know, I've, I've presented twice, I beg your pardon. Once when I actually had to, um, because I, I decided to program myself and I was actually selling the idea of the, the joined up um, uh, portfolio, the dynamically linked portfolio, which I'll, I'll come back to. Uh, and another time when somebody um, blew me out. And so, again, I get very, very few no-shows uh, for speakers but in, on this occasion. But I also, great project manager that I am, have a, have a, a presentation in my, in my back pocket. But I've always studiously avoided being the main attraction. Uh, my, my job is more, I see my job more as a, a film producer, you know, setting the, setting the, um, the scene, uh, providing the, the means and the, the facilities to, 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 to get the ideas, pushing and shoving in the background. Um, but, but also, you know, I, I suppose what I, I do, however, have to my advantage that I have a very deep knowledge of, of the subject. And I've been, again, a great opportunity uh, for, for project management. It's a growing, emerging um, discipline is that you, you could and you can still be at the cutting edge of figuring out how we do this stuff and write it down so that it seeps from practice into policy and then you know then you get the policy makers regurgitating it and saying that should be practice which is what the standards um circularity is really you know so what it, my aim was with the sig was to get a people, load of people that needed to do the job to get in a room argue with each other for months on end about how it should be done and then reach a consensus which we did with earned value <clears throat> And I'll tell you the story of that in a minute. Um, and then create the booklet, 
create the guide. Uh, again, have a whole set of people that knew it was coming and were ready to use it, but they'd be using it. They'd have to put their money where their mouth was. You know, they'd actually have to use the words that they'd helped develop. But we could always, you know, we could always um, uh, revise it, um, enhance it, add to it over the years too. So it was there for, it was under configuration. And above all, and this is what hurt a lot of the consultants, they didn't own it. The IPR, when you, when you worked on my APM, SIG, you 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 left your guns at the door, and you didn't own the IPR. Um, you, you you know it was given freely to, to for, for the use of the association, and uh, and I thought again that was moral high ground. Um, uh, you could see it made a few of them cry a bit, but um, you know they, they, they wanted to take part. But that that was the name of the game, and similarly that that's why I've gone to the BSI again for this current iteration of the project controls. So um, EVM in, in, the, in, in the, uh, the first few conversations we had, and it used to be a lot of brainstorming with post-it notes, was that we would um, we we started out and somebody had the bright idea. I think it was a consultant that we should do three levels of EPM. You know, light, medium, and expert. And uh, and also because every organisation was different and they all had their own context and they had their own sector and their their, their, their way of doing things. And after three months of argument. We, I think, had knocked each other about so much that um, we all realised that, in fact, the underlying process was the same, regardless of. So A to Z, cradle to grave EVM, you still have to have the idea. You still have to have yeah. a notion of scope. You still have to figure out how you're going to execute this stuff. You still have to figure out how you're going to earn it. You're still going to have to figure out how you're going to mitigate it. You're still going to have to figure out how you manage it, you know, and then how you move it along at the end, regardless of whether you're selling flowers and, you know, uh, or the big issue or whether you're, you know, whether you're doing something highly uh, complicated. Um, <clears throat> what I like about, uh, and again, something that I, I've loved about Earn Value, uh, and I'd be very happy to join a discussion on this is, um, so I, I hear the word complexity um, so much, and, uh, uh, and often for me, it seems that complexity um, stood up against complicatedness, um, which is what, what I buy as an idea. You know, complexity is this, this great uncertainty surrounding stuff where, you know, there might be a high degree of, of risk or, or, or uncertainty. Um, and, I, and I think one of the best ways of knocking certainty into uncertainty is, is is doing that huge piece of work at the start of, uh, of a large major project <clears throat> where you try and figure out what the scope is. That doesn't mean to say, and this is a mistake of earned value, that you freeze it forever because mm -hmm. but the point is you get a baseline and any baseline can be audited and changed and configured and tracked. The beauty of earned value is that you basically have um, a baseline, a scope, which I, I, I have also described going back to the pitching as project management for accountants, because you've more or less got what an accountant would know as a chart of accounts with a, with, with a, with a highly developed um, baseline, which means that you can, you can associate cost codes and then get into, <clears throat> into an organization's accounts uh, very easily. And I think that most projects, uh, uh, and again, you, you, you don't really set out on projects without having a rough idea of what it is that you, that you want to achieve or you move towards certainty, you move through uncertainty to certainty by, by getting sure and sure of what it is you're gonna end up with. Even if it isn't what you set out to do, because you now realize you can't, or you realize that you can do more, uh, you, you are um, maybe undoubtedly creating something exceedingly complicated. I remember nearly fainting when I saw the first WBS for the Eurofighter. You know, it had <laughs> hundreds of thousands, you know, is it like a precedence network or an arrow network? And I just thought, my God, you know, how do you get your head yeah. around that in a in a laptop or a desktop? Well, that's a good you question. Need the Steve. wall so, of the so, side so, of a building. Yeah. Sorry. Jump, jumping, jumping in there. I, on, think, I think that's a good that's a good point. Just just to um, to pause and reflect. I think you you're so passionate about this subject, and I think for the listeners, they're going to have to go back and really listen. So there's so yeah, many. Yeah. Sorry, uh, it's, really it's a stream of consciousness torrent. <laughs> no, it's great. It's, I, we didn't want to interrupt your flow. We just wanted to go. So, uh, and we don't want it to stop either. So, I think from from that, that there's a really good point you oh. mentioned. I just wanted to raise around uh, complicated and you're right. You, you go into programs and, and Dale and I've done this uh, and so have yourself and it, there's just too many moving parts to make, um, you know, kind of the purest or the earned value method work properly. We've, we've put too many things in place. There's too much friction. There's probably too much superstructure in terms of organization. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a lot of um, 
really weak channels and pillars holding that infrastructure and that methodology up. What can, I guess, from your perspective, what could people do if they're in that situation where they're walking in, uh, maybe, the, maybe they are ahead of a PMO or ahead of PM project controls uh, or a joint project controls with the clientele mm -hmm. and earn value isn't working the way they want it to. What would be three to five things that you would kind of implement slowly? I know you mentioned, you know, probably having management structure or having that sponsorship yep. and support would be a really good idea <clears> to start with. But what else could they do to start to bring people okay. in and get that sorted out? Well, there's a few practical approaches. Um, one is don't try and do the whole project necessarily or the whole program with earned value. Mm. The best indication I can give you for that, if you imagine a bell curve, the project, yep. it's beginning, you know, slight curve, and then it goes up, you do all the work in the middle, and then it tails off when you get to snagging in a construction project, you know, the, the tail end. So let's yeah. say the beginning 10% and the end 10%, the, the beginning 10% uncertain, don't know quite what you're doing, you're planning, you're scoping, the middle 10%, you're far certain, and then the back end, snagging, just picking up the pieces, uh, finishing it off. Terminal 5, which used earned value, did not switch the earned value engine on until it had got through that first 10%, where it had a greater degree of certainty and controllability. Then at the end of 80%, 90%, with 10% left, they switched it off. So firstly, place the engine over where it's going to work best and work without you having to invent stuff. We were forever bit rolling around in contortions of how do you do, some, some smart Alec would say, oh, we do R&D, research and development. We haven't got a clue. Well, firstly, we haven't got a clue what we're doing, which we used to violently agree about. And then what they really meant was that it was uncertain what they were trying to develop. You know, so they were trying to yeah. get a new, a, a better mousetrap or even a new form of mousetrap that nobody had invented. And um, in the early days, we used to try and we just used to try and jump through hoops saying, well, you could do it this way, you could do it that way. Um, and quite frankly, um, the, the very simplistic thing with, with, with R&D or anything with tremendous uncertainty, or even dare I say where you might apply, well, so you might apply the rules of risk, which is if it's really uncertain, don't use earned value on that particular element of the work package, okay? But enclose, it, uh, enclose the uncertainty within work packages. And, and, and make the boundaries very much 25% milestones. It's something that I've used with Agile in the NHS where they wanted to use earned value measurement without getting into earned value, but they had to control in some way the Agile anarchists as they were. And um, again, I, I have to say that I, I've borne the brunt of people from Agile standing in front of an audience saying that waterfalls are a heap of shit and doesn't work and it's a waste of time and agile is where it's at and me mm. thinking when they describe that agile um allows you to incrementally build and to to, to uh, you know i was thinking well we, you do that in own value you know you incrementally build you you incrementally control you you can do that um and you can innovate uh, really well but what you do is you do it under control so we introduced the notion of you would have uh, in, in the areas of uncertainty a work package which had nothing more than maybe four milestones, which would be begun, started a bit, halfway there, nearly finished, done. You know, so it was almost like the quartile uh, way. And you weren't necessarily interested in cost, you were just interested in physical feel. So you were doing your schedule, uh, your, your, your schedule status. And for people that, again, feel a bit thrown by schedule variants, it's about how, how the, the rate at which you're, you're, you're getting the work done, getting the whole of the scope done. It's not about time not about time and I'll come on to time at another point because I've got something to advertise on behalf of a good friend um, but uh, who was involved in the story later on but um, so, so firstly don't lay it across have really simple means of physical accomplishment measurement so fit and again what what controls person doesn't get objective physical complete okay physical complete not percentage complete mm. but physical complete because again you, you dive into something like and you know, shoot me, lawyers. Something like Microsoft Project, which used to, I think, give a give, give an erroneous percentage complete calculation based upon consumption of budget, rather than what what had actually been yeah. physically done. Or well, sometimes People duration, to, even as well. Just yeah, days, that's days right. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, and that that's erroneous. It's it's not what it is. So 
Again, I'll t a, a London Underground story. Before I became, I, I, I did a, a very large project for the, for the Underground back in the back end of the 80s. It was the first ever implementation of Unix and it was called the business management system. And it, 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 it ran all the contractor stuff to, to, to maintain the railroad. OK, uh, so all the stations, the lifts and escalators, all the trades, uh, P way, all those sorts of things. You see, I can see Je I can see Dale cheering up there, uh, uh, those happy memories. <laughs> and um, I loved the job and I did it for uh, I, I ran the project for a couple of years as we as we built up this this Unix beast using uh, structured um, design methods. And I realized uh, and we went through a, a period where there were great cuts and um, I, I was one of the few people, I was using something called, and I think Deloitte said, oh no, was it Deloitte's? Uh, project Management Workbench. It was one of the first pieces of project management software. It might be even before your time, Dale, you look a bit mm. too young to, to know about it. Project Management project manager Workbench. And I think it was Deloitte's that, that, that uh, um, had, had initiated it. And I realized that, um, and I was publishing essentially percent, right? Percent complete um, every week. And I was a hero. And I realized I was a hero because as, as, as long as I didn't exceed my budget, i.e. my, my budget um, consumption stayed below 99%, everybody thought I was a genius. Now, the fact is that when I got to 95% or so, I realized that I just about ran out of money. But the smart thing was that I could keep going because we were too far gone on that project. There was no way on God's earth they were going to shut that down. Uh, and and, and um, when the cuts came around, I, our project survived largely because I was below budget, even though I hadn't let the cat out of the bag that we were probably going to spend another 25% more to complete it afterwards. And, you know, it was, a, it was a few hundred thousand pounds at the time, which is a lot of money. And um, also my boss at the time, the guy I was working for, just said, keep going, because lots of the other people will, imbe will obey the instruction. And then that will just create the, you know, the fields of green for you to to, to, to to wash up any budget that's that's been liberated to for you to carry on anyway um mm. but it's it, it, it that's where I, I suppose firstly i intuited physical percent complete but didn't really understand it because this was before i'd got into earned value okay um this was where I, i'd come out of production planning in in, in the print industry so I hadn't I hadn't heard about earned value, but the minute I saw the earned value theory when I was asked to flog it as a as, a, as an Artemis consultant, I, I absolutely immediately understood that it's about that really really, you know, integrated measurement of of where you are with what you spent and how much you intended to spend. You know, are are you actually doing what you said you were going to do? And um, so to, to 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 go around the houses on that uh, again, the simplistic is. Um, physical status in as many rough cut ways as possible. It helps an oversight board just to know you've started or, or you haven't started on a timeline. Um, it's really valuable information because, you know, that has a knock on effect on, on, on delivery and knock on effects on delivery have knock on effects on profitability. And that, you know, and that's where you start to think, well, you as a lowly project controls person are actually influencing the delivery as you get into it, are, are influencing the delivery of the portfolio of an organization, which will ultimately impact shareholder value. You know, if that share, whether that the shareholder is the taxpayer through the government or, or, or a shareholder through commercial, commercial ownership. But, you know, so you can see that there's a chain there, but it's often it's not joined up. Um, and, and so I'll just leap back. I, I mentioned the, the dynamically linked portfolio. And, you know, that, that was where I was thinking, well, this is where we can push the earned value um, uh, con uh, control um, way beyond just measuring, um, uh, 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 measuring very, very uh, in a very detailed and complicated level where we are on a project and start to uh, think about it in terms and language that actually means something to the business people to the people that aren't the engineers, that aren't the project community, but are the salespeople, the bid managers, the board of directors and, and the shareholders, you know, the, the major stakeholders that are in, in, in the undertaking. So you can really lift earned value up into being a, a driver of an enterprise. And above all, <clears throat> to go off on another tangent, people have said, Steve, you did, you studied behaviors and psychologies. What the hell are you doing? Uh, doing the most sort of number crunchy, train spottery piece of, project management you know really detailed stuff <clears throat> and, and i'm not ocd so uh, i don't think uh so um 
my answer was that I, I felt that actually doing all of that work liberated me to go and do all the sociological and psychological schmoozing that I love to do and the strategizing, mm. the, the planning and the, the, you know, looking for the gaps and the opportunities within, you know, the organization. Um, why? Because if I, if I was really certain that my data was stable and accurate, I then, unlike the vast majority, maybe, of your audience nowadays, uh, PMO, Project Controls people, it always used to occur to me that there was this monthly cycle where people just rushed around getting all the data in and the, you know their job was to gather data, shove it into a report, press the print button, heave a sigh of relief and then get on with next ne next one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and know that when they publish it, yeah. <laughs> Very familiar. <laughs> know that when they published it, they're going to get bombarded with where does this data come from? What's that? Or, or bloody great big missing chunks of it as well, you know, where people were making it up or or you'd see something and see that, you know, we're going to have to go and double check that and, and all of those things. So, and this really does feed into the, the data analytics discussion um, again at the moment, you know, because I would say if you're really doing earned value, you've been doing data analytics for 30 years. Um, you know, Agreed. Because all, all that information is already there, but you've been, you know, another way of describing earned value is project, you know, some people do, um, project management done properly. You know, you, you're doing all the, it's, it's the best possible practice that we know of that, that, that crunches all the data together to give you what, you what what every project manager and every stakeholder involved with a project manager or project team, which is reliable status, knowing absolutely where you are. Because where, if you know absolutely where you are, you can, you can see where you've been, you can get a rough idea of where you're going to, but everybody else knows that too. So they can make the fancy informed managerial choices about what do we tell, you know, Let's, let's say, hypothetically, there might be somebody on a really major rail project that, that sounds like HP source, but isn't, um, and, and uh, saying, well, this is the truth, but what are you, Mr. Minister or senior manager, going to tell the public or the shareholders? So mm -hmm. I used to think, well, that, and, and this again brings about uh, uh, thoughts on unfairness, really. The responsibility for the delivery of the information and the, and the performance and the progress and how it's characterized in the public eye or the, or the business eye or the organizational eye, often um, the project is used as the, the kicking boy for that. You know, they're the ones that are, they're scapegoated, you know, it's performing badly or it's gone over cost mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And I know, and, and with these major projects, I know the people who are managing and controlling that. And I am certain absolutely certain that they haven't screwed it up i am certain that they are sat on absolutely accurate information but that somebody else is taking that and choosing to maybe be more economical with the truth um and, and, and maybe knowing you know for an example of that would be would we and i asked the audience would we have won the olympic bid um at the value if we'd actually told the truth about what it finally turned out at which was about three times what we won the bid on. Would we would we have won it? Or were we actually savvy enough to know that if you bid at this rate, you'll win it, and then you know we'll change control it and there'll be other powers that be. The trouble is that pays badly, that plays badly in the press. And the, the, only, the only thing that saved its ass was that it was a spectacularly successful one. And everybody kind of walked into the idea that it was fantastic, and better than the Australians, better than Sydney. <laughs> Better than Sydney. Ooh. Come on, Val. You got to respond to that. Except, except, for the fi except for the fireworks, obviously. But um, oh, you know, it's, it, it's that sort of thing. Yeah. Is but, um, so. So where, where am I going with this? It, it's it's very much um, we have it within our gift with earn great data, which could really reinforce data analytics. And, uh, but also feed very much into the driving of an enterprise's portfolio, if you understand a portfolio, to be made up of programs and projects and business as usual, but all based upon, you know, a, a huge integrated set of, for the want of a be better word, WBS structures or, 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 or uh, parallel reporting structures so that everybody could be kind of standardized and integrated at a higher level, notwithstanding down at the lower levels, you can do what you like in order to to achieve scope and you know use all your different ways of doing things. So I'm not saying there's a one size fits all approach, but uh, yeah. you, you could say that the outturns from all of this stuff should be standardized because that's what helps management manage better, auditors 
manage better, assurers manage better, stakeholders get better, you know, all of those sorts of things could, could still come out of that. And I still can't think of a better way of gathering that information than, than the framework that a, a properly executed earned value project can do. But I can also say, using the rudimentary steps inherent within, within earned value, where you haven't ever used earned value or structured project management, but just getting that notion of, we've done, a, you know, we've started, we've stopped, we've done a little bit, we've done half of it, we're nearly there, is, can be a really easy way to, to start to inculcate the disciplines and, and is part of the, the road where ultimately you may end up using full blown earned value. And I saw that used to massively um, successful effect in the IT industry, again, considered by many to be totally ungovernable, um, at IBM, um, there was a classic presentation we did early on in the life of earned value. They had a, a programming center at Hursley, about a thousand programmers, and we had their guy there who'd introduced those basic metrics to sort out the anarchy that there was with um, software delivery of programs where it was Clint Eastwood territory and it was the one with the biggest whatever gun, shall I say, that, that won and shouted the most that got priority mm. in the delivery of software. Um, and, and what uh, earned value did was it, it actually it actually gave the people, the poor project managers, a way of being able to ask and control the delivery guys, the programmers. And also the programmers started suddenly started to wake up and think, if we, you know, by telling you the truth of where we are, you're not going to eat us alive anymore. You're actually going to go and fight for more time or more resource to, resource to do something or, or hold the vultures out, you know, away from us so that we, we, we do things in a more managed order. You know. And what happened was that their, their productivity and their effective delivery went through the roof over a couple of years. But it really took you know, yeah. some, some heavy lifting in terms. And that was a cultural thing as much as anything else. You know, they really had to remove the, um, let's say, the stock exchange barrow boy mentality out of it and, and and get it to work in there but but it but it paid off and paid results you know and in consequence um it it, it, it began to embed the use of structured methods notwithstanding the fact that you know it, it can get interpreted it can get interpreted and it can atrophy and then that opens the door to well the people who think they've got the answer and um, um whilst i don't disagree with the the virtue of of agile um i, I think any, any any project manager worth his set uh, worth um, is sought is somebody who does do that sort of prototyping lean management stuff anyway when you know rather than just mm. throw the baby out with yeah. the bath so you know I, th I think again a blend of agile and other techniques is the way forward rather than just going hell for leather on one or the other the problem is that they're 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 almost trademarked ways of doing things, and it's almost like you know you buy our product, you use that, and um, you throw everything else out of the way. But the smart pro the, the smart project controls people. You you can see uh, the good ones. They cherry pick. They 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 take what's good for them as and when. What they like to know is what's in the shop window. You know, yeah. and and then to use another analogy, although I hate the game, um, you know, you you have you have somebody, a project manager or or any um, able person able to manage projects. They have the golf club. And like at the golf club, you get to a particular green, you look at the green, you assess where your ball is, you assess what the green looks like, you assess where it's going to, you know, what the threats and the obstacles are, and then you choose the relevant club to do it. And so essentially, at some point, you might pull agile out, you might put, pull lean out, you might, you know, you might, you might say, right, well, we'll use full blown earned value on this bit, but you, you choose the club. So you're not just using one thing. So again, I see more and more, I'd much rather think of pe people to think of earned value as a framework within which to work um, and then say, well, within that, we embed agile, we embed um, proactive scheduling, you know, re really deep, deep dive scheduling. Um, we, we, we use risk management in, in these areas. We also, uh, and I think the next innovation is to really sew uh, solidly in, in, into controls output, the measurement or the identification and measurement tracking, not how you do it, but tracking of benefits uh, mm. because benefits are, as good an indicator of any as to how well a project is doing. And without the tracking of those benefits, I think the controls and its ability to communicate transparently with the rest of the business community who it's serving, um, they're missing a trick. So what we're going to try and do- Steve. With the, 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 yeah, go on. Sorry, go on. Steve. Yeah. Can I jump in there? I was just going yeah. to ask you about that because one of the things is, is um, when you talk about earned value and maybe for the, for the less informed or less educated on the methodology and, and the framework, as you mentioned, 
yeah. is is the benefits and that's a really good segue into yeah. well how, how do you link the benefits and what are the benefits of earned value from you know objectively like do we have maybe it's access i'm not sure of but is there a study is there surveys is there quantitative data that says if you implement earned value you will get x return um i've been asked the question before how do you quantify roi and that's just one benefit mm -hmm. but there's obviously more benefits than that um from your perspective what do you think the linked benefits are of having earned value on projects if if any um i i don't think anybody has done uh, I, it's a question i asked um uh, uh when i when i was ch chairing the sig yeah. at the apm and we asked around there aren't any there are very very yeah. few actual uh, pounds, shillings and pence um, articulations. Um, and, and it is a, uh, you know, you, you could broaden it and say project management is, is an act of faith, it's an article of faith. You know, it's got to be better. Um, it's got to be, um, it's, uh, um, it must be more effective. It must be more efficient. And the trouble with that is that it then gets very open to, um, if you can't prove it, you know, as, as, I, as I think it is very difficult to prove universally across, uh, across yeah. the patch. I mean, it's fair to say if you didn't use earn value to develop um, some of these the, these huge construction projects, they would be out of control. Um, but by, by the same token, you wouldn't be able to audit them. You know, you wouldn't be able to, to, mm. to actually see what the true cost position was anyway. So you have to have some kind of um, uh, uh, control position, whether you like it or not, you know, even just from a sort of fiscal responsibility to, on the fact that you're going to get taxed on it at some point by, by, by the government. Um, if you can, um, so, so, so really one way to turn it on its head is, did it absolutely meet the expectations that you wanted it to? Um, and there we could go into a discussion of iron triangle, cost, time, shed, you know, quality. And I would say the trouble with that is, it's one of the poorest indicators of whether it did what it was supposed to do. Or what, or what people intended it to do, because you can meet those criteria and still have the most disappointing, lackluster building process deliverable that just doesn't 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 do it. You know, mm. um, again, my, my 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 star example uh, for the UK is the Millennium Dome. That got built arguably to time and budget uh, and quality, but people didn't have a bloody clue what it was. <laughs> uh, 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 what it was for. It was a vanity project mm. at the time, um, or mm. it was described as a vanity project to, to mark the millennium. And then it rotted there for what, 10 years? Until it now became, you know, it, it is now, well, pre COVID, it was the most lucrative entertainment venue on the planet. You know, you could put one stand up in there uh, for, for 30 nights and make an absolute gold mine for everybody you know it, it was but did anybody think about that when it was done was it in its purpose statement um no and the only reason it got funded was because you know it, it was it was a government thing at, at the time well where am i going with that so there are examples of vanity projects there are also also examples where once they've got the money god help you you, you can't stop you can't stop a train once it's going you know and a lot of people um, will persevere with the project and they're not interested in discovering halfway through that it's not going to quite do what it's supposed to do unless unless you change its course contractually, you know, and um, uh, ask for all that extra money that you're hoping is going to come out through change control, which again is how a lot of companies conduct their business with, with, with taking on projects. Um, so over the years, I, I've got far more involved in um, the arrival of benefits as an idea, um, having more um, evidence that the that there is a purpose to a project beyond just the bricks and mortar or the deliverable, um, and fully support the idea that most benefits aren't aren't delivered um, until after a project has actually finished its construction, let's say. But it's real use, it's real purpose. The where the real benefit comes is when it's a hospital. And it's not just when the doors open, it's from it's from when the doors open and that it gets used that you start to be able to bring about those other really complicated metrics, which is is it making people healthier, happier, more prosperous, you know, mm -hmm. reducing overall costs to, to to society. But 
what has pricked my ears over the last few years is more and more, certainly um, from, from government quarters, people have been saying, you don't get a project off the ground unless there is a benefits realisation, uh, there's a business case with a benefits realisation plan in it. So I thought, well, surely that means that, that if there's a benefits realisation plan, that can be quantified, shaped on a curve, and theoretically, in addition to the earned value curve, the third curve on, on your standard project chart, the first two being the forecast and your actual costs, but the third curve being the benefit, which is showing you how, how well you're earning the scope, uh, the thing that's being asked for. Why not plaster profile that benefits curve from when it starts, which could be at the start of the project and the programs to deliver, right the way through the life of the projects and the programs, but <clears throat> because I, I very much buy into the fact that the vast majority of benefits should come after the project and program has, has shut up shop and gone away, but somebody should still stay focused on tracking the return that's, that, 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 that comes about of the use of those benefits and keep and start feeding that back into whoever's making their mind up about, you know, what, what constitutes value for money on behalf of the, the, uh, the shareholder or the taxpayer, you know, and, um, I, it occurred to me recently, because again, a, a large textbook on something called earned benefit uh, was issued um, by a guy called Kick Piney, um, who I had over to, to come and talk about it a couple of years ago. And um, I was also thinking uh, in relation to the worry beads coming out for the project control community uh, being beaten up by Martin Paver and his data analytics mob saying it's all going to be AI and machine learning and new lot are all going to be out of a job quite soon. And you can see they're all massing behind the PMO ballot barricade at the moment, you know, all, 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 all thinking that it's going to be all right if they just stay doing the, the right thing. And me thinking, well, somehow the project controls community has got to be more than these guys running around and girls running around um, uh, gathering the data together. They've got to give a, a, um, a proposition that, that, that demonstrates value. And one of them could be, well, firstly, providing really good analysis, uh, really great recommendations. Um, and, uh, you know, that they, uh, something that they do every month to do that is this drumbeat of gathering data and, 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 and producing the, the, uh, the variance analysis that, that goes with it. And I'm thinking, well, you, do, you may not have to understand what constitute you don't with, with a scope curve uh, you, you, or a baseline. You may not understand what, what made that baseline the shape it is, but at least you've got something from which you can measure month on month to see whether it's happening or not. And also you can begin to introduce and integrate that practice of measuring and mitigation that you can do at the moment, for which I see almost zero evidence of that occurring uh in, in the day-to-day -day practice of the projects and program community in the uk or dare i say it globally at the moment i see the proliferation and the growing of the great new idea one of them was data analytics another is is, is benefits management and again what benefits management does, does is the classic they think they've discovered something new and then they try and do everything with it just using benefits management you see very, very little um, diagrammatic representation of benefits management being reintegrated into the overall um, project and program curve uh, yeah. uh, way of doing things. You know, it's a bit like you get a cut. It's like we, did, we used to do in SIGs. You know, you, if you give a SIG, uh, a SIG by definition is a specialism, you get them working on something like benefits or risk or, or, or earned value. And if you leave them to it, like Topsy, they'll, they'll over-engineer it and they'll see everything through that perspective. What somebody sensible has to do in the collective SIG, if you like, in the with an overview on the SIG, is to tell it occasionally, each of these SIGs, to shut down and integrate this back into the overall body of knowledge or the overall structure, then call that project, and then that redefines what project management is. But it's project management mm. that can now do this. It's reshaping the shape of the paradigm of what, what it means to do project management. Remember, five, ten years ago, portfolio management meant almost bugger all in the uh, in, in project terms, you didn't really express things in, in, in portfolio thinking. Now it, it's quite straightforward to do that. Similarly, the use of risk, you know, but again, risk was a classic example many years ago of being completely disconnected. You'd have a risk, you'd have a risk management department in a large organization. They should have been the same guys that were managing the projects. You know, they shouldn't have been a separate discipline. They should have it reintegrated yeah. at, at some point. So similarly with benefits, I'm saying, well, God, wouldn't it be simple if all a, benefit, all, all a controls guy needed to do 
was to, to, to have that curve profiled, you know, time phased over, uh, over time with a curve that was going maybe from the very beginning or even just before the beginning of, 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 of a portfolio's work, where the idea is, you know, up for, for just an idea, being able to track that on the radar right the way through its delivery and execution and preparedness as a, as a, as a portfolio and a program for which 90% of those portfolios and programs are producing potential for benefit, right? They're not producing the benefit, they're producing the vehicle which will make that benefit happen. And then the 90% of the benefit, I'm prepared to get shot down on that percentage, is then delivered five, 10, 15, 20 years afterwards. That really should be being tracked both from a business point of view, because who in a, in a large organization wouldn't want to know who really likes this stuff? You know, feed that, the fact that people, you know, think this is the best thing since sliced bread. Feed that back into the marketing and the uh, and the strategic sort of operations of a of a large corporation. Really, really valuable information. They don't get it. They might see it a little bit in sales, but but you know, basically, it's that kind of information which I really think for you know really makes for that bigger picture informed management decision making. But it also pulls the project community right to the very beginning of the process and maybe being able to participate in the elaboration of the benefit before it gets chucked over as a project where they say things like the classic, who sold you this then? This is never going to work or, you know, <laughs> it's going to be late. And again, remember, if, if, if HS2, um, lots of stuff in the news last week about the, the next year is completely changing, the, the current COVID Brexit climate completely changing many of the benefit assumptions of why we're doing HS2, okay? Because industry is is going to take a huge knock um shouldn't that those ben or, or to me that that's saying that whilst the benefits may come eventually maybe they're not going to be delivered for another 15 to 20 years maybe that was the plan for hs2 anyway but it just struck me that when a large project like that suffers um a knock to its benefits it actually should have and be dynamically linked back to the projects and programs that are executing it because let's just say for example the the, the 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 delay or the cost escalation actually when compared to the original business case which got the benefits through the start gate are eroded so that you get the benefits down to zero ultimately what would any sensible business well what would any sensible person do well the sensible person maybe the, the taxpayer would say well if it's never going to deliver its benefits should we be doing it yeah but the trouble is you have to ban you have to balance that against the company who's saying we're making a shed load out of this keep going you know even if it's never going to make any money at least we'll get our we'll get our contract delivered and we'll get we'll get our money for doing it uh, and so that brings us into the moral and ethical dynamic dimension of project management and also the role and the part that, that is to be played, played by project controllers and project managers and, and the stakeholders that they're you know the servants of and the uh, uh, and the the people that they, they, they should be sitting aligned as, uh, alongside uh, at board level and senior uh, ministerial level because again that information i believe should be made available um uh you know absolutely regularly and as part and parcel of what we do and and should be kind of uh what's expected of everybody but will i think i hope people can can see the picture help everybody do all th this job we call project management and project delivery far far better in a far more joined up way you know right down from the micro level right up to the macroeconomic and global level and uh, and i suppose that's why i've stuck with this this, this 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 thing called project management because i really you know people say i want to make a difference i i know i've made a difference and i know that project management will can and must continue to make a difference but could do so much more than it it really is already you know i was granted the the compliment that with the introduction of earned value that at least um the the, the use of earned value within government and here, here is a figure that was given to me by a former auditor general um, who, who said that the use of earned value, because the audit office are really good at doing calculations of the sort that we're, we're talking about, about on their value for money audits. Um, it, 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 it was, was 700 million pounds that had been saved oh, you know, over a long period of time, but lots and lots of money. So mm -hmm. if you, the, the, the trick again is not to make those savings, but what the hell do you do with that money? You know, where, where, where do you do that yeah. to bring about improvements to society? And um, I suppose for me, um, uh, also, I'd you know I'd rather I'd rather be famous than than rich, in a way. So I'm I'm very because because the idea is is massively fulfilling, 
Um, and it's not it's not just a job. And it's so much more than a pain in the ass from somebody down there who's who's offering up these figures, which are rainy on the day of a marketing manager or a, you know, a, d a divisional director um, who's being shown, you know, being given the bad news, if you like, because turned on its head. It's also the deliverer of much that's good and also the deliverer of much that is potentially great news and opportunity for saying we're doing far better than we expected. You know, here's a gap in the, um, and if we look at the portfolio, we've suddenly got, I don't know, a three month window where we can bring together, bring forward a great deal more work, or we can start, you know, we, we, we can, we can grow the, we, 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 we can grow the turf we're operating in, you know, expand the, the organization because of this kind of information. Yeah. And so I, I don't see why couched in those terms, we, we can't become absolutely the best friends of the board. Uh, and again, my, my ultimate vision is, uh, the halfway house was there should be a project director on every board, and I and I and I have said and been beaten up for it vigorously, is that actually the job of project management and the associations like the Association for Project Management, the PMI, is to disappear project management, and by that I mean it should be so integrated into the everyday life of every individual working in a team or organizational format or individual format that they take on these tropes these characteristics of what's good about organizing things and getting things done that they don't actually need to refer to a project manager because the project managers are all there they don't need to have a project manager come and explain it to them but everybody can do that and if everybody understands what the, that doesn't mean to say that they can't be levels uh, d down which the work has to be executed and carried out but imagine if you had that sort of like a, it's a weird, you know, it's, it's that sort of, you know, you know, I was, I was, uh, there was something on the radio last week about fungi being the largest organisms on the uh, on the earth. You know, the sum of the size of, yeah. you know, yeah. playing fields and and, and 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 half a country. Well, imagine if we could have produced this organism that really <laughs> intuitively knew everything about getting Project things management. done. <laughs> you know, the, these fusion skills that I've related, you know, the, the, the problem solving skills, the the um, the life skills of, of, of getting things done. And if every man, woman and child from seven to 70 was able to do that, you know, um, that, that will be the true, you know, the true visionary outcome, because there would still be projects, there would still be pieces of work to do for everybody, but we'd all be doing it far better. And in a way that we could, um, operate more transparently and, and actually more uh, able to, to step across all these sexual boundaries because we had this we had a, we, we had these these abilities and I'm not saying they're innate but I do believe that they can be identified and developed and and shared and uh, everybody can find their place in that you know uh, yeah. again what, what's the difference well there's still creativity there's still innovation there's still the great idea they're still bringing ideas from elsewhere but all within this this overarching framework such I a good like point. I should um, have a rest now. <laughs> sit down and have a rest. You can have yeah. a rest. It, <laughs> as Val says, um, such amazing flow, such um, great passion. It, it's such a joy just listening, you know, just, just you going yeah, on absolutely. and on and so much insight and experience as well. Um, yeah. But I, I just, as we head into the final section of the pod, yeah. I think it would be remiss of me not to ask this question for the audience is, right, <laughs> Steve, you've given me your elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, as someone new listening in to Earn Value can give me all these great, weird and wonderful things, where do I get started? How do I learn? Where's the best place to actually start picking this up and understanding it um, from an educational perspective? Is there any specific organization that does it better than the other? Or do I go about learning from other experts, experts out there? Do I listen to the Project Chatter podcast? Do I contact <laughs> Steve course. Wake? Do I go to his EVA yeah. 25 conferences? Um, you know what? What? Where's the best place um, for for folks to to pick it up? Wow. Well, um, you need to go to an organisation that's using it. Um, whether they're the ones that are, are, and and I well, it's not the method. It's the it it's the mindset. It's yeah. almost coincidental that it, it, it's in use somewhere. But obviously, it would be very useful if you were. Are there certain <clears> sectors <throat> that? Um, are better well, than other sectors? Well, de def definitely construction, transport, highways, energy. Um, all, all, all the big guys use it. Um, a challenging, interesting one would be, and we've been trying for a few years, but it's it's hard work, is pharma, pharmaceutical. Big industry, lots of money. Um, I'm not sure whether COVID's going to save its bacon. 
Um, but I think that, um, you know, they've been struggling for years. And but in, in the previous years, they made so much money that they didn't really necessarily do anything more than pay polite lip service to, to, to being more effective and efficient because there was a huge and it's the same with other organizations and other sectors, large troughs of money. Um, one of the key things is that unless and I have to say, as valuable as this is, you still need governance in place at all levels. Yeah that tells you that you've got to do this and so again we creep into the world of contract you see when when push comes to shove you can be using earned value but if somebody comes to you and say why aren't you you know why didn't you give me this information in earned value terms and you start to have an argument guess what comes out first of all the contract the doors slam and they say it wasn't in the contract yeah so you it's got to be embedded in the contract now so no matter so again you know Maybe a bit daft, but so are we doing? Are we running contracts that are driven by uh, earned value? And what method of you know what are they citing as a, an earned value reference? Now, again, flatteringly, in the UK, they, they refer to the APM guidance that, that I oversaw and steered into use, but then got reciprocated with the ANSI standard. I quite frankly, I, I would, I would look at some of the um, apprenticeship programs that are being run by. Um, some of the large organizations uh, you know i'm really loath to it's really difficult for me to name names because i don't want to disincentivize mm. um yeah. so, some people because i know that some people they do it because they're doing it you know it's ticking the box stuff sure and they're they're not doing it uh, or and some really mean it is what i mean i'll give you one example because I, I can cite that from last week's there are well maybe not there's one example, and it's in the area of diversity uh, and inclusion. Okay, and again, I've got yep. strong thoughts about that because I, I think again, there's a lot of tick box in there, which I despise. Mm. And um, but what worries me is that there are certain organisations, some with wheels on, but not yours, uh, that are massively successful in hoovering in a very very diverse set of applications right so they're great at recruiting the trouble is that they seem to have made the mistake of thinking that by recruiting all these diverse people that it's going to it's going to diversify the culture that's that, that's waiting to receive these people in these large organizations right so a lot of these you know bright-eyed bushy-tailed you know encouraged people be they, and this is why I like apprenticeships, be they 17 or 57, because what I love about apprenticeships and what really needs to be reinforced is that you don't need to be a kid to start an apprenticeship. You can, you know, you can get back on the boat or the train any <laughs> any time you like. Yeah. So mm, I think that's massively yeah. but for me, that was a real eye opener. Because for me, there were little street urchins running around Victorian London, you know, and they were Oliver Twist kind of thing. But it can be any age. But the, the big problem is that many organizations can be some of the most F off, unwelcoming, un, you know, supportive places that, that ever walked this God's earth. And often that's the management setting a tone, you know, the punitive culture, the don't dare open your mouth culture, don't ask questions culture, do as you know, do as you do, do as I say, not as I do, all of that. And there's still a huge behavioral transformation to take place and saying, rather like I did with earned value, there's a metaphor. We shoved earned value into organisations that were professionally um, incompetent as far as project, the basics of project management were concerned. And we thought that by plugging earned value in, it would encourage and foster best practice. It just meant that a load, load of bozos screwed it up even quicker than they would have done. Yeah. And, but what got thrown out was earned value. Similarly, you get these, these people that are, are listening to diversification and apprenticeships, and I believe apprentices will suffer from the same thing, only to be only to be parked in an office, not talked to, not involved, you know, not 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 shared with, not developed in, and mentored in the way that they should be. So the real trick is to is to get the behavioural psychologists and the you know the, the behavioural people in to transform the the way we do things uh, as well. Back to my fusion point. My aim was to get every child, man, woman and child from school level and up using these fusion skills as part and parcel of their everyday learning so that they've all got this stuff so that when they get recruited by, by whoever, from wherever, 
they all go in and they all kind of know how to do it. And what our trick is to make sure that the receiving organizations tune their organization to take advantage of that. As in addition, we tune up the HR uh, organization, both large organization and recruiting agencies to recruit against that sort of standard of what somebody who can really get things done and, and work reflectively in a project organizational manner um, and, and, and again, my hunch is that if the HR people who get who get incentivized and given bonuses for recruiting the right sort of people and re-engaged to keep on recruiting the right sort of people, get given that kind of template to get those sorts of people in, it will make everybody you know far more successful and prosperous. It's a, it's a big idea. What was your question again, Dale? <laughs> where, where, where would one get started? Uh, well, I would, I would, I, I would have a flick round on. Uh, on a great company that's offering a really supportive uh, apprenticeship. Um, I would, um, one of the, one of the things I found with earned value though is, or and, is that I, I've got to know, which is why I've got such a great address book now after 30 years of doing it, I've got to know and being involved with some of the biggest projects around the world. And with the people who've been managing and running that yeah which is massively exciting and you know thrilling when you see something as, as mundane as an spi and a cpi being you know used to manage and bring in a an olympics or or a, um, a health program anywhere in the world i would suggest that if uh, and also bearing in mind that infrastructure and construction is where you know, a lot of project management, it's project management's heartland. Um, go to those companies that are involved in those projects that, you know, really excite you. So, for example, there are quite a few construction consultancies, uh, outfits that are making great play of um, working on projects of value, you know, that appear to have a social purpose. Yeah ones that are really focusing on sustainable and circular mm -hmm. economy is another one. Yeah. See if they're talking about circular economy, see if they're talking about sustainability, see if they're talking about climate change mitigation. Because as I said, project management is probably the best placed bunch of people because win, lose or draw, good weather or bad, disaster or success, you'll still need projects to either um, prevent project, prevent climate change from happening or to mitigate, you know, the screw up that's happening as a result of climate change. You know, the, def the sea defences will have to be built or, or a city will have to be reconstructed that, 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 that really goes with the ideas of, of, of circular economy. I believe that you mm -hmm. can match the idealism of climate change that we've seen in the young and, you know, in the old as well, by looking for those people that are appear to be most supportive and moving in, in the direction of doing that. And I would hope also that you're going to run into a lot, a, a lot of people far younger than I uh, who, who subscribe to that idea too and are able to build that, you know, in and around themselves. So um, see if they've got apprenticeships. You know, there's a financial apprenticeship uh, incentive to, to get involved with that. Um, there are rules and regs, so they're well governed. You know, they're, they're, there's good oversight of these things because people don't get money for nothing. But also see whether it's, you know, these 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 companies are telling their overall story as one because stories are important. Mm. You know, do you feel that what you're doing is worth doing? You know, does that make you feel like you're a better individual? Um, are you making a difference? Can you make a difference with that? And uh, can you um, uh, um, and, and does you know, and does that therefore mean that you can stay also in the, in your location? You know, far better to. To um, you know, to, to so if you live in London, well, try and improve London. Mm. If you live in uh, in the Northern Powerhouse, try and improve Manchester. You know, get involved, find out. Well, do a bit of reading about circular economy, as well, because that that's uh, you know the buzzwords that I'm using: circular economy, sustainability. Um, again, sustainability suffers from the same thing that everything else does. That everybody has a, a rough idea of what it is, but it's not it's not hammered down in contract or standards quite yet. And what standards can do is give you contractually watertight terms and words that can be used so that we can get it right properly and effectively. And similarly, this is what we're trying to do with the new control standards so that we've got a whole set of terms that, that people won't be able to sort of dink between the cracks on when they're 
when they're setting their their, their workers and their organization up. and that's not to be entrapping at all it's actually that thing of if you've got stability through a standard it liberates you because you don't have to worry about having to go and explain yourself each time you know when yeah. you when somebody says it's a project that's really what it means or when somebody says you're going to use sustainable practice that's what it really means when somebody says skills that's what it really means you know yeah. um and so, uh, and so much time and energy can be be uh, wasted by trying to disentangle the ambiguity that's in there and and, and lawyers fees as well um so you know so, so, so again um dare i say you know get and, and get more open-minded you know don't, don't just read project management textbooks read about you know the big stories of the day i mean there's a great um story uh, about um the guy who i can't remember the name of the damn book but it's a really brilliant story about how uh, an american guy what um put in a bid uh for the uh olympics in washington and um they came second to the uk i think they didn't win the bid but actually the the bid was put together in such a way that they would regenerate parts of the city with new york parts of the city um on the back of the fact that everybody will put their hand up and say, we'll give you this money and this money in order to regenerate, you know, because there's, there's supposed to be a legacy part to an Olympic bid. And they made just, they just made damn sure that they, they were actually embarking on winning in a regeneration program for the city. Uh, the, the icing on the cake would be to get the Olympics as well. Um, but what he did was he motivate, but, but using the Olympics as the leverage conversation, he got into that and, and, and kind of helped transform the, the thinking and, and, and doing of, uh, of a metropolitan environment. But the point of that story is that you can dis you can extract that story and then say, well, let's use that kind of model, that story in any in in any um, I don't know uh, anywhere where you where you want to put a build a circular economy because the circular economy is basically you stick a, a pin in at the centre of the radius and then you you extend it out 50 miles and say let's try and do everything under the sun within this 50 mile radius you know wow. so that we we make everything we we manufacture everything we employ everything for within first and foremost within that 50 miles. And then if we need it from somewhere else, we'll get it from somewhere else. But, you know, and, that, and again, that's how you, re, you know, for me, that's a philosophy and approach, which which is how you genuinely re regenerate, you know, a country. Yeah, and that's and that, such uh, yeah. such good advice there, Steve. Um, so, um, uh, as I said, um, I, uh, and get a mentor, you know, get 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 friends, get people. I, I'm, um, dare I say, uh, the what served me well is 30 years of networking. And sometimes I, uh, so I still know people from 30 years ago. I stayed in touch with them. It's never been about the business in the sense of, you know, it's, um, you, you do get, there are plenty of fair weather friends. There are plenty of people that you're, you're, the, you're the best friend because you're, you're the gateway to a contract. But when it boils down to it, the people that stick with you are the people that you meet and have a chat with you have a beer with you go to lunch with they're they're in your they're in your game uh but you you stay friends with them you know you yeah. they're, they're, they're colleagues they're peers uh, and it's that those relationships because uh, again um if you um if you if you think about where's the next job coming from or the next assignment you've got a big network you're 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 hugely magnifying your choice and chances of, of, of doing that Plus, if you need support, they're there for you, yeah. And you can do what I've done at the moment, which is they become your army. This is how you, you know, you 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 pull stuff into use, and um, you, um, well, and, and that that kind of gives you a comfort, you know. It's it, it's 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 relationships, networks. So don't drop people, and um, don't ignore uh, because again, you you sometimes find that it may not happen today, whatever it is that you're talking about. But it might happen in six months time or two years time. I've often picked the phone up a couple of years later and said, do you remember when we met? Well, it, <laughs> it's time now. And the other thing that yeah. I've done and I've worked really hard on is seeing the project management in, uh, for me, the arts, just to close out on music. I, I am, I've been, always been passionate about music, any kind of music, um, uh, live, uh, from rock through to classical to, to opera. You know, I, anything that makes a noise. The reason I like silence is my, 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 my albatross really is my Achilles heel is that if I've got music on, it completely distracts me and I get engulfed in it. So I can't have it on in the background or when I'm driving or, or stuff like that, you know, because I, I, I focus and I, I merge into music. I've got the biggest 
CD collection. I know that's old hat in, that you've ever seen. You know, it, it, it's enormous because I've been collecting since about 13 or 14, but I love it. But uh, uh, in that love of the arts, I've gone to theatres and seen orchestras and singers and comedians and actors and people who followed my events over the years. I've never been shy of going up to um, uh, an orchestra or a string quartet or a choir or a poet or a comedian and saying, do you know what you do? There's bits of that in project management. Come along and tell us about that. I'll, I'll tell you why it's got something to do with project management. You look for the project management in the story. Stand up comedians. Stand up comedians are the best thinkers on your feet that you'll ever meet. Yeah, they yeah. can and they're the, the, the best listeners that you're ever likely to come across. Listening, tremendously underrated skill. I know you've done it very well today. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's that thing of the real trick to knowing about stuff is listening. Because unless you really listen to somebody, you haven't got a clue whether what you're going to spout out at them is, is, is going to land home. And often many of the clues of what you really need to tell these people is in is in listening very hard before yeah. you go back. You know, do your homework with in your relationships and I said so I, I I've wheeled stand-up comedians my, my current event has a a performance poet um who, who does a poem at the end of every broadcast so we do it for half an hour Q&A at the end of the Q&A he comes out with an A4 screed of poetry specifically about the broadcast that just taken place it's immensely skillful to be able to synthesize almost live um you know a a, 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 a coherent piece of poetry um, but demonstrates that you know those skills are 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 hugely valuable in in, in our day to day lives. You know, notwithstanding business business interactions and and bits and pieces like that. So when you look at a, a singer or an actor, or you look at the staff behind, or you look at the film, you know, the the film crew that brought us Lord of the Rings or something like that, you imagine the project that was behind that, yeah. and then imagine yourself working on something like that. You know, there's nothing more exciting than than being able to visualize yourself in those positions and then finding ways of getting into to doing it. One way I do it, you know, is in some of the concert stuff, I'll see a musician I recognize if I go to a concert and I'll wander up to them and talk to them. You know, go, go and talk mm. to people, go and network. Uh, bloody difficult, I know, uh, but it's, you've got to be, you've got to get rid of the shyness, you know, but al always have an idea, always have a story, a picture in your head that you can, pitch uh, uh, that person and and you'll find more often than not that people get interested they're flattered or they're you know they're they're, they're, they're not worth it <laughs> good you advice know? there steve okay it's right i'll fantastic. shut up now oh i've got no. one advert can i give an advert please <laughs> go go for it's it a yeah, give a quick one. one yeah my mate walt <laughs> lipke walt lipke from oklahoma in ohio shut the back door on the most the biggest vulnerability in evm and he invented or created something called earned schedule. Now, the, the Achilles heel in earned value is its ability to manage time as a, a proper time factor, to really give an estimate of a time-based uh, um, arrival point, yeah? Walt sorted that out. And um, Walt um, suffered what lots of people who bring new ideas into onto the parade that aren't from the establishment, and he got vigorously beaten up by the establishment for doing that and, and shunted away and shunted away. And yet this is the biggest innovation and improvement to earn value technically that's taken place. So if you're using earn value, you, well, you'll have to use earn schedule now because A, it's, it, it, it's appeared even in the, the practice standard uh, for PMI, which at one point I was involved in. It's also figures as an annex, I think, in the EVM standard and it's in the implementation guide forthcoming to ISO standard so it's going to be part and parcel of your day-to-day -day work but if you're really interested in time as a factor and doing it really effectively mm. using own value use his book it's just published get but track walk down get get his email talk to him he'll talk to anybody he's lonely so we've uh, actually uh, we've, we've done that steve um, oh, have you? so yeah. uh, i've right, been chatting okay. to walt um this week and yeah. um we're going oh, right, to have okay. him on next season uh, oh, well. so okay. i'll come yeah. along and heckle <laughs> yeah. right. you're welcome so that, to so that's just out. And um, I think it's, it's $35 okay. on Amazon. You won't find it on Amazon UK, but go to Amazon.com. Um, but again, if you Perfect. want several copies, contact Walt Direct and he can probably do you a deal. Yeah, no, so we'll... End of effort, but a great guy. You know, one of, one of the... Um, again, somebody who's done it for the absolute good of the profession. Yes. Um, yes rather, yes, and, and the subject. Not, not, for, 
not for money at all. Yeah, no, and we and we need more folks like that. And yeah. you know, Absolutely. like yourself, I mean, I, I want to thank you for your time. It's been so insightful, as as you know, Val was saying. It, it, it was it was really difficult to, um, what's what's the way to put it, to interrupt your flow because there was so much good coming out. I was making notes as you're going, and and I'm going to have to go back and listen to all well, the wise it, the wisdom that you've shared. Well, I hope I've conveyed the fact that it is interlinked, and so from that simple Absolutely. idea. What bit of project management do I need to do to improve percent complete? I no, absolutely, the only idea it's... Is, and it's all stemmed from from doing that and taking interest in that. Yeah, but coupled yeah. with can I make a difference? You know, can I feel better at my, about myself when I leave this mortal coil? You know, thinking have I actually done something that that has been worth it? Um, I, I genuinely do feel that. You know, and I, and I think that most of us who get involved in well life affirming projects can can walk away with you know with, with the prospect of being able to do that too and even if it only means that you earn enough money to to foster your friends and your loved ones then you know that's still a massive purpose too so you know, exactly it, exactly it doesn't, have, it, it doesn't have to be um taking over the planet but there's there's all sorts of good that can come out of it so um just a suggestion when we come back uh when we get closer to the project controls and the benefits management standard I would be delighted to come back and talk to you about those. Uh, We'd love to get, have you back on. Get a, uh, a, big, a bigger picture on that. Yeah. It would be, uh, yeah. yeah, those standards are due next September. So probably, you know, sometime next year, um, uh, sooner rather than later, you know, around the springtime, be happy to come back and share what we've been up to there. Brilliant. Well, we'll, okay. we'll keep an eye out for it. And uh, thank, thank, thanks for those thoughts. Okay. Just before we go, Steve, uh, we have a quick pop quiz uh, called right. Tenor, if you're up for that. Um, 10 yeah. questions, quick quick fire questions. Um, you up for that? Yeah, go on. Okay, question number one. What's your morning routine? <sighs> Get up, clear the dishwasher, um, <laughs> have a cup of tea, make the wife a cup of tea, um, have a bath, get to, uh, uh, um, and then switch on at 10 o'clock. Wow, that's quite a routine. Question two, how do you usually plan out your day? And the first thing I do is clear all the email. Nice. Which, nice. which can be voluminous. Yep. <laughs> it's the but, thing of going to work. You know, you, yeah. you, do the, you do the domestic and then you, you get in the office. Yes. So, yes. so I leave the bedroom and then I come back to the bedroom. Nice. The bedroom is now the office. Nice. I, th I think we uh, lost you a little bit there when I asked question ah. two. Uh, how but do you usually plan out your day? Um, I, get a, I get a blank sheet of paper. And I scribble down what I'm going to do. Nice. So this, uh, and then, I, and then I, I, I run with that until I've done it. So it might last a day. It might last a week. Brilliant. Question three, how do you deal with stress? Well, firstly, I have no difficulty sleeping. Uh, no anxiety. I, I am, my wife tells me I'm the best at going to sleep she's ever known. Nice. Not that she's known many, but... Um, uh, she, uh, I, I have no problem. So even in the worst of circumstances, I know that if I go to sleep, um, it's like a, it's, it, it delivers me from, and quite often in dreams, I get, I get the solutions to whatever might be an issue. Um, by delivering stress, I have found that I should never angst about it. I go and try and meet it mm. as soon as it starts to gnaw away at me. Nice. Um, but by and large, I've become so bloody clever. <laughs> and articulate that I can I can normally field and fend and defend myself. So dealing with stress is is often by making sure that it doesn't happen. So have have the answers. You know, don't uh, be prepared to, and also be prepared to not be scared of what you don't know. I Good think that, within this within this thing, what what I know that most people fear is the blank sheet of paper. Yeah. So, so but sometimes my role is to say I'm going to be brave enough to fill that sheet of paper, even though you're going to tear it to pieces. Yeah, but I'd yeah. rather you had a blank sheet of paper rather than some words to go at. Absolutely. So always have a story. Question four. What's your favorite book, audio or movie? Wow. My favorite book has to be because I read it um, to the exclusion of everything else was The Lord of the Rings. Awesome. That's come up a few times, actually. Right? When I was about 12 yeah, or 13 true. and it was recommended to me and I read it under the desk and at home for about 10 days. It consumed me. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely amazing there's an advert for lord of the and, and i'm still still massively you know i've never I've, i must have read it nine or ten times and i've read it to people read it to my kids 
in installments and they uh, uh, and I still am absolutely wedded to it yeah nice question five who is your hero and why wow I suppose one of my heroes is Ernest Shackleton and Ernest Shackleton well actually it's, it's a combination dare I say it's, it, it's Ernest Shackleton for his humanity um, he re- led the expedition that failed to, to, to get to the pole, but he was a tremendous, compared with Scott, a tremendous man manager and seller of ideas. Um, my other hero, more grudgingly, is, uh, and who the English hate, uh, is Roald Amundsen, who, the Norwegian explorer who beat Scott to the pole. <laughs> Um, largely because he was a bloody brilliant project manager and planner. There you go. There you go. There's an advert. Number six, and I think we know the answer to this, but maybe we don't. What is your favourite sound? My favourite sound? Well, if it had to be actually married up into something, it's going to be the finale to Beethoven's Ninth. Nice, nice. In the Albert Hall. In the Albert Hall. There we go. Number seven, <laughs> number seven, what is the biggest mistake you've made on a project? Wow. The biggest mistake on a project was going into spec a purchasing system, writing down chapter and verse, absolutely everything everybody told me about the purchasing system, going away and developing it and coming back and realizing that I'd, I'd automated absolute garbage <laughs> and bullshit <laughs> and inefficiency because wow. these people didn't know what they were talking about. That was the biggest mistake. So we had to redo it. And that was one of my first big specking jobs as a consultant. I never did that again. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't. I'm sure never you did didn't. that again. But it was it was realizing rather like with your parents, that they're not always right. Yeah, yeah. So right. it's constructive challenge, you know, and a bit of skepticism. Well, talking about parents and children, I guess. Question eight. What would you tell your 10 year old self? Learn to play the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I would say that um, rather like Shackleton, never give up hope. Always remain hopeful. Nice. I don't see myself as a pessimist ever. I see myself as somebody who is always thinking it'll 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 be better. And also, I think there are many ways that I can that you know that I am in command of that. You know, I'm the most important in in, in providing hope for me. Yeah. And for others, but, you know, never give up hope. Agreed. Agreed. If you don't have it yourself, then how can you give it to others? Question nine. What profession other than your own would you like to have attempted? Well, it's similar, but I would not like to have run one of these opera festivals or orchestras. So a big, one of the big uh, opera houses um, or smaller opera houses in the the UK. Yeah. Yeah. because it's it, it it gives to get you know it's it's that synthesis of all the skills that you use as project manager, but it really is combining that with uh, um, the arts as well, uh, and uh, and also it can be converted to public use, and it's not just for rich people. Yeah. And tops. Yeah. No, very very well put. Final question: If you had to spend a million pounds in a day, what would you spend it on? <laughs> Wow, a library with enough shelves to take all of my a wood lined library in a in, you know <laughs> in rooms big enough to and in order so I could there I could OCD put every index everything in the right bloody order because at the moment rather like a dragon and his gold I've got to remember where every bloody bit of it is because it's littered all over the place but yeah and a really nice spacious library with a huge I've got a really good stereo anyway but with a really huge listening area. That you know was 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 like being in a concert hall. Amazing, amazing. Well, it's been. I think it might cost me more than a million, though. <laughs> it may it may well do, but yeah. it, it's a start, isn't it? But Steve, yeah. thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, um, your transparency and openness, and and sharing with with the audience and the listeners out there. Um, like I say, there's so much, and we'd love to have you back in the future at some point. Yeah. We love the rabbit holes you went down. There's there's so many nuggets of wisdom there. Um, Val, any final thoughts from you? No, it's just great to, to listen and, and the depth and, and the density of content. I think it's going to be something that people should play back a few times and just really pick up what, what's useful for them. Um, and then 
obviously apply earn value where they can. I think it's the same. I'm a really big supporter of it. I think more education is required. I think fast learning and learning experience acceleration needs to happen earlier on well, in the process. I, I, if I could just chip in, I am told that earn yeah. value is enjoying a resurgence at the moment by <clears throat> not only within yeah. industry, but by the people flogging the idea. You know, so some of the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the places that do that. And I would have to say there's no better way to start than get the the a, the APMG's qualification in earned value and planning, which APMG offer, largely because I was one of the major developers of it, <laughs> for and on behalf of the APM, but the APM flog it under license to uh, yeah. APMG. So if you actually want a fairly, and I, I did all the scenarios, which I have to suggest are brilliant in the practitioner because uh, they've got my, my, my wacky of course, of course. My wacky imagination yeah. in there. But ha no, so if you want a qualification that you can wave at people, then maybe that would be a, a decent start uh, place to go and start and, and have a go. I believe the planning yeah, uh, uh, the planning one is the best seller for the APM, but the uh, the earned value one is you know really hits at home what you need to do, and it's tough as well. It's a tough exam. So it's good. Thanks, it's yes, the purpose. Um, apart from that, I think I will return the compliment. So you've been very kind hosts. Um, and uh, um, I have enjoyed it. Um, it it's uh, very rare that I, I actually speak out loud uh, about how it all fits together. So that's that's been um, interesting for me. So I should be interested to to listen to and not too embarrassed. I hope to, to to listen to the playback. And I may well return the compliment and drag you into one of mine, so you can come and explain yourselves <laughs> there. So be Absolutely. careful. Happy right, to anytime. Guys. Okay. Good to see you. <laughs> Happy to. Thanks, Steve, thanks, and, and, okay. and thanks and thanks to you, Val, because we're recording this one at almost 1 a.m. your time, so appreciate you staying up this late. Um, so thank you very much, Val. So, folks, that's all we have time for on this episode, but it doesn't have to stop here. Support our charities and access blogs at project, projectchatterpodcast.com. Don't forget to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel and on your favorite podcast player so you don't miss the next one. A big thanks to our guest, Steve Wake, and thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now. Goodbye.